sack by Gardak. I'm Dennis Gardak, linebacker for the Arizona Cardinals. As an undersized high school player, to playing Division II, to working at McDonald's, my path has been anything but ordinary. While I've been rehabbing, I've spent a lot of time in our facility. During this time, I've gotten to hear some amazing stories from our staff. And it's always fascinated me hearing how everyone in the building has gotten here. And if there's one thing we all have in common, it's how uncommon our journeys have been. And this is how I got here. One of the most important components about what we do is the physical preparation. Today we're going to be talking to Buddy Morris, one of the most important guys to what we do. He makes sure that we stay in great shape and that we're at our best when we get on the field. Buddy, what up? What's up, Dennis? We good there? I'm good, thank you. Let's start with the heavy hitting question first. When's the last time you wore sleeves? <laughs> I actually stopped wearing sleeves, Dennis, when I was with the Cleveland Browns. Uh, don't ask me why I started doing it. It just became a part of who I am, and ever since I've been doing this job, I've never worn sleeves. I was a competitive bodybuilder for years, so for years I looked great. Now I'm just an old, beat-up guy who just... So it was kind of to let people know, like, Look, I still got it, or you wanted to show off the ink or uh, combination? Just let people know, you know, I'm old, but I still got it. Okay. That's okay. all. Was that your first uh, NFL team with the Cleveland Browns? Yeah, first job was with the Cleveland Browns. Uh, I had spent my entire career at the University of Pittsburgh, born and raised in Pittsburgh. I was very fortunate that in 1980, Jackie Sherrill had a great vision before really the running strength and conditioning coaches actually hired. Uh, went out on a limb and hired me before he even got approval from administration at the University of Pittsburgh. I was there for my first 10 years. I left Pitt in, after 1989 season due to an illness to my daughter, Kara, which you all guys know. My oldest daughter's on a liver transplant list, so when she was diagnosed with uh, autoimmune and chronic active hepatitis, I decided to take a step away from coaching. Uh, and for seven years, uh, I raised my family in a very small town northeast, northwest of Pittsburgh in Hermitage, Sharon, PA, outside Youngstown. In 97, I get a call from a couple former Pitt players. One was Dan Marino, one was Emo Boris, and the other was Jerry Osaski. And they asked me if I'd be interesting, interested in returning to Pittsburgh because they were going to make a change. Of course I was and went back in 97. I never had any desire. It wasn't my life's dream. It wasn't my goal. I wasn't gonna, my life wasn't gonna end if I never got to the NFL. It was never my real, I never thought about getting here, to be honest with you. Uh, I just thought about doing the best possible job I could do where I was. And when the opportunity came, I took it. Uh, and then the rest is history. Right, hit. What's the difference in your day-to-day -day college-wise versus now that you're here in the NFL. Four. The more advanced you become as an athlete, your greater your outputs. The greater the outputs, the greater the cost of those outputs. You only have so much, so many resources in the body for recovery and for energy. So what we look at with our athletes is, do I want my outputs to be general, which is the weight room, or specific, which is playing the sport? The process of obtaining sports mastery, technical, tactical, psychological, and physical, I have control over the one of those. So there's a time and place for everything. Here you have guys that come with a history of prior injury and you have to program around that. So when I put something on paper, that's a guideline. That's all it is. That guideline is subject to change based on the uncertainty of daily training readiness, which we assess when you guys walk in here, and the fact that the human body is a multifactorial complex organism. Its response to loading is highly specific to the individual. Same thing as in injuries. There's no one reason for an injury. Injuries are multifactorial and complex, just as the human body is. Every injury is unique to the individual. Every injury is different. Every rehab is different. What guides us in our rehab is the individual and your responses to the training stimuli we provide for you, but also, obviously, you know, the amount of force plate testing we do here, the amount of Nord board helps guide where Dennis Gardek is deficient. So we can bring up all those deficiencies to help you recover more quickly. All right, buddy, let's head out to your other office. The place I am the most comfortable. The stretching area? No, the weight room floor. <laughs> yeah, Ev, come get you a shot, man. Those biceps on camera. All right, buddy.
buddy. You say you started in 1980 strength and conditioning wise. Since then, there's been a few different pieces of equipment that's come out. There's been a million different philosophies. Kind of how do you decide what's science-based, what's actually working, what's actually specific to us as athletes, um, and kind of what's Instagram fads? How do you kind of figure out what's real, what's not? Uh, I don't have a philosophy, Dennis, as I've always told you guys. Philosophies are for philosophers, and I'm not a philosopher. I have a system. That system has expanded and evolved over years and years of learning. But it's one thing I know, I know the extensiveness of what I don't know. I think it's my responsibility, as it's my assistants, Mark and Evan, and every strength coach or physical preparation coach in this country, to constantly study. If you limit your knowledge, you limit your abilities. If you limit your abilities, you limit the development of your athlete. We always talk about recovery methods, and there's some great advanced recovery methods out there, but over time, like anything, it's gonna lose its effectiveness. All programs work, they only work for so long, nothing works forever. We're not clones, we're all individuals. How you respond to a training program is gonna be different from how I may respond. So when I write programs, it's based on positional requirements, and so we've developed a hierarchy of qualities needed for each position, and it's also based on the individual. For example, everybody bench presses. The first thing people ask you is, you tell them you lift weights, you play football, how much you bench? Listen, we can bench press, we can dumbbell bench, we can machine press, we can cable press, we can do loaded push-ups. Who cares? If it strengthens the arms, the extensions of the arms in a scapular plane, who cares what you do? They're not gonna put a power rack in the middle of the field at the beginning of a game, at the middle of the ice rink, at center ice, the middle of a basketball, or the middle of the pitch, and say, okay guys, let's have at it. Nobody's gonna ask you when you step on the field, how much you bench and squat? Should everything be sport specific? No, if you wanna train specific to sport, play sport all year round. Now here's the problem with training specific. You open up avenues for compensations and more increase of injuries. In general development, you don't have that. People are more likely to get injured in SP, SPP, special or physical, uh, sp specific physical preparations compared to GPP, general physical preparation. What bridges the gap between what I do general and specific in a sport is practice. You wanna get better at the sport of football? Practice. We are a very gimmick oriented society. We want quick fixes. We love gadgets, gizmos. We love the latest, greatest, top secret, double probation never seen before. Cool exercise. We all fall Especially into that. as NFL athletes, because we're highly specific trained and we need highly specific. You think you do. Yes. You think yeah, you exactly. do, and that's, that's the mistake. So if you look at all these different certifications you can get on a weekend, there's and all these different gurus out there. Everybody wants to be the guru sitting on the mountain. There's no one specific answer. We operate in a gray area. You have all these people out here who, if you tell me to pull a hamstring, they'll give you a thousand different reasons. You know, when we train, when I ask you guys to train, I have to take into account the effect I have on the cardiac, cardiopulmonary, detoxification, hormonal, metabolical, central nervous system, neuromuscular system, immune system. My goal is not to outrun the slowest of those systems to recover. My job and my assistant's jobs are always constantly figuring out you guys and what works best for you. The basics have the most profound influence on the human body, which the basics, when we talk about, go back to recovery, hydration, nutrition, and sleep are not sexy. They don't sell. The three pillars. The three pillars of what's innately built into your system, but are the essentials of life. I think what you said that kind of separates yourself from other strength coaches is you, you're not even talking about the gains being made. You're talking about how quickly you can recover from trauma. And I think that that's something so important to us. Those gains are, are only good if we're able to use them. So I think that recovery side of things is something that's kind of missing in what we do. We've trained on four week blocks here. The first block, the first week is introduction. Second is destruction. Third is production. Fourth is deload. And that we drop down so we allow a summate, a summation of all the effects that have been trained in the previous weeks to be stabilized. So everybody wants to stimulate, adapt, stimulate, adapt, stimulate, adapt. How about stimulate, adapt, stabilize? Stimulate, adapt, stabilize. I think people forget about the value of stabilization. People forget the value of actually recovery. How can I promote recovery between workouts so we can achieve higher levels of physical preparation? Our goal as physical preparation coaches to help, is to help you achieve the highest level of physical preparation using methods and means, and when I say means, it's an exercise, that yield the highest possible results at the lowest cost. 
Your stability of your fitness level is proportional or directly related to the amount of time it took. it took you to acquire it. Anything easy gained come, fast, easy go. Be lost fast. So if you're that guy who waits the last five weeks or after mandatory minicamp to try and ramp it up, you're making a grave mistake because you're not going to have a lot to fall back on once the season starts. Those are the guys who we look at and say they're the most susceptible to injury. All right, buddy, we've talked a lot about recovery. Let's go get some foam rolling in. Great. All right, buddy. So after 42 years of doing this, what's the perfect program? You got to have it down by now. You know, unfortunately, that does not exist, and here's why. Of all the variables we had to manipulate as physical preparation coaches, when I say variables, I mean sets, reps, tempo, speed of contraction, exercise selection, sequence of events, whether vertical, horizontal, low, which most people don't know the difference of, or they do single set or multiple sets. All those variables have their own benefits and they have their own drawbacks. So if there's not one perfect variable, there can exist not one perfect program. I have a plan, but that plan is always subject to change when we come out from the office and you guys are on the floor preparing for a workout. And one of the ways we judge is everybody's just laying on a foam roller and they got that dead eye look and they're using the foam roller as a pillow or just laying on it. And there's not a lot, you guys don't sound like a bunch of chatty caddies that I've got to be willing to change, especially if it's a high CNS acceleration max velocity day. But the goal is to make plan B as close to plan A as possible. So one of the things that gets us through training camp is obviously being able to bring energy and excitement and with it comes music. <laughs> what do you think of the EDM stuff that I put on versus the rap that's usually on? And Yeah, you gotta understand, I was raised in the 70s. I love 70s rock and roll. I love 70s funk, which every Friday in this weight room is Funk Friday. Friday. And it's my selection of music. So you're gonna listen to Earth, Wind & Fire, Cool and the Gang, a little bit of R&B. Uh, the Teddy Pendergrass, the great R&B singers, the great funk bands, the OJs, all that's going to be played here, here on Friday. So you have, you have, you have one have. more <laughs> chance to squat. What was your what was your max back in the day? Squat. Um, without bragging. Uh, Obviously. And it was a close stance, and it was below parallel. It was a little over 600 pounds. All right, so you, you get one more chance to put 600 on the bar. What's your go-to song? Oh, Red man. light, green light? No, that's a great song. <laughs> Joe Wall, you and Joe Walker made that fa uh, famous. I, you know, there's a couple. Best of Both Worlds by Van Halen, Right Now by Van Halen. Right uh, Now, a little bit right AC, now is a good DC, one. Uh, Shoot to Kill. There, there's a lot of different go-to songs, but my go-to song back in the day was uh, Right Now by Van Halen okay. for Heavy Squad. Yeah. Yeah. What is it, Can't Always Wait for Tomorrow? Isn't that how it starts? Uh, no, it starts with an interlude of the piano, and then oh, goes, I, yeah, I, Can't Wait for Tomorrow, yeah. Come on, right huh? now. Yeah, I know that song. That's I listen perfect. to Van Halen. That's unusual, because I don't know your EDM crap. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for the next episode of How I Got Here.